Last night, we, uh, I, I tried to um, s- sort of reframe how we would think about discipleship and Christian formation by revisiting this question, the very first question that Jesus poses, the first words that Jesus utters in the Gospel of John, which is this piercing question, what do you want? And the reason why that's such a piercing, invasive, fundamental question is because to ask what I want is actually to bury down to the deepest sort of core and fiber of who I am because it's really asking, What do you love? And in fact, there's this wonderful sort of bookending function in the Gospel of John where the first words and the first question that Jesus asks is, what do you want? And the last question that Jesus asks is, do you love me? And what I'm suggesting is that those are in a way the same question and they are the most fundamental question of Christian discipleship because you are what you love. You're not just what you think, you're not just what you know, you're not just what you believe. Those aren't, in fact, as defining and uh, uh, um, as orienting as this more base question, what do you love? So what do you want? What do you love? This morning, I wanna pause and I wanna drill down a little bit deeper on that question because I think if you start to realize that our very, the very core and fabric of our identity is located in what scripture calls the heart. That I am what I love, then I also think we have to face this disturbing reality. You might not love what you think. You are what you love, but you might not love what you think. This was sort of an epiphany for me uh, when I was watching uh, this film that Probably no one has seen, unfortunately. Uh, But I'm gonna try to describe a little bit to you. It's by the Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. Does anybody know Tarkovsky? Any film students here? I see that hand. Um, So, okay. Let, Let me just sketch a little bit of the plot. It's actually pretty straightforward, and then there's this gem of a revelation in the middle of it. This is a Russian film that was, uh, um, appeared in 1980. It has this simple plot that has three key characters. The the movie, by the way, did I tell you, is called Stalker. But it's not really scary, it's not like freaky. It's it's this story. There's There's a person, a character named the Stalker, who is really, it's kind of an unfortunate, I feel like there's something lost in translation here because really he's the guide. He's somebody who is going to lead these other two characters named the writer and the professor. Super creative names in this film. But you have the stalker, the guide, and then you have the writer and the professor. What you have to do is picture a world that is this kind of post-apocalyptic wasteland. It's, it's like Cormac McCarthy's The Road. It's, this, it's, it's Mad Max-ish. It's uh, um, this, this uh, dark, barren, sad, tragic landscape. But there is in this world a region called the Zone, which is like an oasis of joy amidst all of this Chernobyl-like destruction and loss. And within the region called the zone, there is then this inner sanctum simply called the room. Everybody with me? So you've got the stalker, the guide, who is leading the writer and the professor because everybody wants to get to the room. Everybody wants to make a pilgrimage to the room and the stalker is the one to take you there. Why? Because in the room, you get what you want. This is a magical room. This is where the movie sort of shifts from, from being like Cormac McCarthy's The Road to something like the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. It all of a sudden becomes this sort of magical possibility. It moves into this sci-fi uh, 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 imaginative reality and the room draws them there. The room is the goal of their pilgrimage, this long arduous journey because in the room they will achieve their heart's desire. In the room you get exactly what you want. And so, part of the movie is this, the challenge of making it there, they get into the zone, they're now making it to the threshold of the room, and right as that happens, all of a sudden, professor and writer get cold feet. And in a remarkable book by Jeffrey Dyer, the critic, 
uh, called Zona. He describes the scene this way. Let, let me, let me uh, repeat Dyer's description. He says this. They are in a big, abandoned, derelict, dark, damp room with what looked like the remains of an enormous chemistry set floating in the puddle in the middle as if the zone resulted from some ill-conceived experiment that went horribly wrong. Off to the right through a large hole in the wall is a source of light that they look towards. For a long while, no one speaks. The air is full of the chirpy chirp, cheep cheep of bird song. It's the opposite of those places where the sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. The birds are whistling and chirping and singing like mad and Stalker tells writer and professor, he tells us that we are now at the threshold of the room. This is the most important moment in your life, he says. Your innermost wish will be made true here. So here we are. This is the place where you've wanted to get to. This is the place where you can have what you want. Who wants to go first? Both the professor and the writer stop and don't want to go in. Why would that be? <laughs> Wait, you've, you've just done this long, arduous journey, right? The whole point was to get to this place where you can have what you want. Why wouldn't you step into that room? Both the writer and the professor have this disturbing doubt that kind of bubbles up in them, and they start asking themselves this question, what if I don't want what I think? Well, says Dyer, that's for the room to decide. The room reveals all. What you, you, what you get is not what you think you wish for, but what you most deeply wish for. And all of a sudden, there's this very disturbing epiphany that's creeping up on the professor and the writer. What if they don't want what they think they want? What if the desires that they are conscious of, the ones that they have chosen, so to speak, what if those are not, in fact, their most innermost longings, their deepest wants? What if, in some sense, their deepest longings, their most unconscious longings that have been humming under their consciousness unawares, what if those are for something else? Would you want to step into the room? Do you know what you want? Do you love what you think? See, I think as Christians, we should have some sense of identifying with this struggle, this tension, this worry, because let's do it this way. If I ask you as a Christian to answer the question, what do you want, right? If I ask you to answer the question, what do you really love? Of course, we all know the answer to that question. <laughs> It's not a problem of intellectual knowledge or conviction here. You know what you want to say. You know what you ought to say. And you, and, and you will be entirely authentic and sincere in your, your articulation of that. If I ask you what you want, you know what to say and you know what you want because you have an intellectual conviction about that. But what about if your wants and your longings are actually shaped be below the radar of what you are consciously aware of? What if you stepped into a room that showed you not just what you think you want, but the, what you really sort of have oriented your life towards? Would you want to step into that room? Are you confident that what you think you love actually aligns with your innermost longings? This, says Dyer, is one of the lessons of the zone. Sometimes a man doesn't want to do what a man thinks he wants to do. Now, I think one of the great blessings and gifts that God gives us is that the practices of Christian worship face this disturbing reality head on. By the way, free little footnote for a second. One of the things that struck me last night and, and that a friend pointed out is, uh, um, you know, I've been talking about the role that worship plays in shaping us, changing us, transforming us, really recalibrating our hearts, loves, and longings. I, I do want to say, can I just point out one technical thing? When I say worship, I don't just mean music. Is, that, is everybody with me? In other words, I, I know every time I say worship, you're thinking 
singing, which is absolutely part of worship, but I, w I actually want to today get us to zoom out in a, in a more expanded sense of what we think counts as worship, as the entire story that the people of God rehearse when they are gathered around word and table. Right? So when I talk about worship, we're not just talking about being transformed by a song service, we're actually talking about the entire repertoire of what the people of God are called to rehearse when we gather around word and table as the body of Christ. And if you think about this tension, would I step into this room? Do I know what I really love? I think one of the great gifts of historic Christian worship is that it faces this tension, this reality, this gap between head and heart, right straight head on, and it invites us then into a practice of confession in which we own up to our own worries and doubts and struggles about this gap between what we know, what we love, and what we ought to love, and where our longings are really oriented towards. Let me give you an example of what I think is a beautiful prayer of confession from the Anglican Book of Common Prayer that names this tension beautifully. And imagine being a people who are regularly invited to own this reality in this prayer. It goes like this. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. Spiritual maturity is becoming the kind of people who have this realization that I know the devices and desire of my own heart sometimes outstrip what I know and even what I believe. And that if God is going to make me and mold me and alter me, he actually has to transform the devices and desires of my own hearts. The body of Christ then is that unique community of practice, of rhythms, of routines, of formative worship that owns up to the fact that we don't always love what we say we do. We don't always love what we say we do that the devices and desires of our own hearts often outstrip our best intentions, our best knowledge, our best believings. In fact, the practices of Christian worship will be precisely the kind of tangible, practiced, reformative way to address that tension and gap we talked about last night, of closing the gap between head and heart. But I think, I, I wanna spend a little bit of time this morning um, talking about why I think this changes how we should look at our own sort of rhythms of cultural immersion, uh, the, the routine, the daily mundane routines that we are involved in. And that's why I, I've, I've subtitled the message this morning, taking a liturgical audit of your life. And I want to work towards explaining what I mean by that. If, if you were there last night, I tried to emphasize that love is a habit. Right? Love isn't just an emotion. Love isn't even just a choice. When Paul describes love as a habit, as a virtue, what that means is love is like this, this uh, uh, interior disposition, this, this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, inclination that is cultivated in you so that you become a certain kind of person who is leaning in a certain direction and toward a certain end. When we call something a habit, that means it's second nature. It, it comes to you without having to think about it. It's just part of the fabric of who you are. It's like breathing and blinking. And to make love a habit in that way is to, for it to become so woven into the fabric of your character that now it bubbles up from who you are. But here's the deal. The way you learn to love is through practice. It's not just, there's not a direct channel from the intellectual deposits into your mind about what you ought to love to then all of a sudden that just flipping a switch and you now have the dispositions. The formation of our loves actually takes time of being part of a people that is oriented towards a certain end. So not only is love itself in some ways unconscious, the formation of our loves can also be unconscious. 
If you learn to love and how to love and what to love through the rhythms and routines and rituals that you are part of, friends, one of the things I want us to realize is that means that you might be learning to love in places you didn't even realize. But it also means you could be learning to love the wrong things (laughs) in the wrong way. You can become a people who consciously and intellectually are, have all the right convictions about who you want to be and who you want to worship, and yet because your loves are shaped at this unconscious level, you don't even recognize the way that your heart is being bent and misoriented and miscalibrated, as we, as we said last night, to some rival god, to some rival kingdom. Our idolatries are not primarily intellectual convictions. They are affective capturings. So consider the implications of that for what you love. If if you think of, let's let's call love-shaping practices, routines, rituals. I want to call those liturgies, okay? Not just to use a sort of high churchy word, but to say that we are talking about loaded love-shaping practices. Liturgies are the most formative kinds of practices. If... If liturgies are love-shaping practices, however, what that means is they are not just something that you do, they're doing something to you. They're not just expressions of something that you believe, they are forming what you will believe. Now, if that's the case, if liturgies are these love-shaping practices, then it also means that liturgies are not confined to churchy spaces. And in fact, there are liturgies everywhere. There are, the, 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 the we, we tend to have sort of cultural awareness where we are worried about the messages and ideas out there in a culture. And because we have that narrow bandwidth of focus on sort of intellectual content, we completely miss what's going on under the radar and don't realize that in many ways, the culture isn't trying to change what you think, the culture is trying to change what you love. And the way it's doing that is not by trying to change your mind. Let me me give you a couple of examples, see if if this works. Um, Several years ago when my oldest son was a teenager, I remember one day he asked, um, Dad, will you take me to the temple? And I was like, "Mm, oh, and then I remembered. This was actually a mild parenting win because it came out of a conversation we had one time in which I tried to describe to him why the mall is the most religious site in any city. And so I was telling him about, I gave him this law, this is what it's, it's terrible to be the child of a philosophy professor, okay? Because this is how dinner conversations go, is dad just waxes eloquent about why the mall is a liturgical space, it really functions as a temple. And so when, when he asked me, dad, will you take me to the temple, I think he's kind of mocking me. But I'll take it, because it means he remembered the idea, right? Well, what's, what's going on here? Why, on, on what way could you think about the mall as a temple? Because the mall doesn't care what you think, but the mall really cares about what you want. And it actually wants to make you the kind of person who thinks the satisfaction of certain wants will make you happy. The gospel of consumerism is not a message that you are convinced of. The gospel of consumerism is a vision of a way of life that you practice your way into by participating in the liturgies of the mall. Now, these work fantastically. First of all, the mall has an unbelievable evangelism program that is called marketing, right? And and this, uh, I'm actually being dead serious because the the way marketing works, uh, because this is kind of what breaks my heart, I think the mall has a better appreciation of the fact that we are lovers than the church does. I think the mall actually has a better insight into the fact that the center of the human person is the heart while the church is trucking water to our mind. Because when you get to the mall, uh, um, well, what draws you there is marketing, the evangelism of the mall, and how does that work? The evangelism of the mall is not trying to provide you with any knowledge or information. Watch any 30-second commercial spot, 
and see if there is any information about the product in that commercial. There's not, hardly ever, right? Why? Instead, what happens is, in 30 seconds, some of the most brilliant minds in our culture work in advertising, right? And because one of the things, and some of the most creative minds, because what they are able to do is in the space of 30 seconds, actually within the space usually of about 23 because they need seven seconds to sort of show a logo and so on. Within the space of 23 seconds, they will tell an entire story. It's a narrative. The way the evangelism of the wall, mall works is it doesn't appeal to your intellect, it appeals to your imagination. And it pictures a story in which you say, I want to be a character in that story. Oh, and it turns out all the characters in that story drink Starbucks, drive Volkswagens, blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's sort of like left unstated. But what happens is, is you are captured by a vision of the good life that is painted for you in this affective, imaginative medium of the story. And so you are pulled in. And then imagine when you get to the mall, right? The mall is this, uh, the mall, uh, by the way, it's not an accident that the mall hearkens to sort of ancient cathedrals. In fact, there's an architectural historian at the University of Virginia that has documented the sacred architecture of the mall. Or think of, or, or the, the, um, the temple-like Buddhist space of the Apple Store, right? All of this is intentional because what it's doing is it's inviting you into a space. The mall, um, the mall has its own liturgical calendar, right? You, it has its own seasons and colors and space. And when you walk into the mall, it's almost like space and time are transformed. Have you ever noticed there are no windows in malls, right? Once you're inside a mall, it's very, very hard to see outside except for the sort of baroquely folded light that comes through skylights and things. Why? Because now you want to be in a space that is almost timeless. And the best thing that can happen at the mall is you lose track of time. Right? And as you are walking down the labyrinthine corridors of the mall, hopefully getting lost is their goal, one of the things that you'll notice is all along the wall are the icons of the good life. They're called mannequins. They are dressed in the sort of vision of what will make you happy. And the way that this, the, the, the mall's gospel is predicated on the thrill of novelty, right? That I need that and I need it now, even though in three months that's gonna be old and, and boring and I need to throw it away and get the next new thing. But the way the gospel of consumerism gets a hold of you is not by changing your mind, but by captivating your heart. And if you are immersed in these rhythms and rituals without realizing that they are in fact doing something to you, right? The mall isn't just a place that you go. The mall is a place that is forming you, shaping you at this unconscious level. Then you could realize, now you can start to feel the nervousness about stepping into the threshold of the room. Because on the one hand, you're good Biola students and you're getting, you know and believe what you ought but if you're not aware of all the ways that your loves and longings and desires are being captured by cultural liturgies, you might not realize that your deepest, innermost, unconscious longings are still bent, are still miscalibrated, disoriented. I'll, I'll give you one more example of the way these kinds of secular liturgies work. Do you notice, we haven't talked anything about what's being sold, we're just talking about the way of life that's associated with it. I'll give you one other example. Um, uh, th this comes from, uh, I'm convinced that if Martian anthropologists ever wanted to really understand North American society, they should just study beer commercials, okay? Because beer commercials are like this, this portal into a worldview, right? And, and I remember one day watching this um, beer commercial. I must have been watching a sports or something. And this beer commercial comes on. It was, it was for a really lame beer called Michelob Ultra, which is not... not I, I've, so I've heard, at least. I don't know. I think it's not... <laughs> Friends, if you're going to backslide, don't do it with Michelob Ultra. <laughs> um, anyway, so there's, there's this fantastic um, portrayal in which... So, okay. And we also all know that beer commercials are inherently sexist, right? So just stick with me for a second. These guys are at the office. It's the end of a work day. 
They come out of the office building. It's time to go home. There's a car sitting at the curb. It's this guy's car. It's a terrible car. Who would ever want to drive that car? And so the guys come out. They don't like that car, and so they simply do this. Boom. Beautiful new car. It's a beer commercial, so it magically cuts to the beach, right? All of a sudden, these guys are on the beach. They see some young ladies off in the distance. They're thinking, oh, well, these, these might be interested in this, but they can't really quite dwell. And so what they do is this. And all of a sudden, the ladies are up close, and they can see them, and they're drinking Michelob Ultra, so they're totally into these guys, and everything's going fantastic, right? Cut to another scene. They're at the club now. The DJ is up. They're, the DJ's playing stuff that they don't want to hear. And, and so once again... Now they're hearing exactly what they want to hear. And I stepped back and I thought, that is fantastic. Heartbreaking, but fantastic. Because actually, what they've just shown me is that this device is training me how to relate to the world. Do you know what I mean? Do you see what they've done? All those movements is they've taken the tiny little micro rituals of how I engage with this device and have shown that in fact, that's kind of what I want the world to be. And it, 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 we're not even talking about the content that you're looking at here. S Steve Jobs, I, by the way, I was totally looking up to see if I could get an early showing of the Steve Jobs movie since it's Los Angeles, but it's not till I leave. Steve Jobs is the absolute master of desire and wants. That's actually all Steve Jobs really had going for him, and he knew that there would be something affective and formative about the intimacy of our interacting with a device inside. You don't touch an iPhone, right? You sort of caress it a little bit. <laughs> There's something sort of inherently affective about it, but notice what this commercial is illustrating is that quite apart from what I'm looking at, this micro-ritual has effectively taught me that I am the center of the world and I should never be bored, I should never be uh, uh, unentertained, and I should always have what I want at my fingertips when I want it. That, friends, is egoism. But the way you learned it, the, the illustration is beautiful because it's not because somebody came along and gave you an argument about why you had to be an egoist, they just gave you a phone and the phone comes loaded with liturgies and rituals. And in an implicit way, in this unconscious way, you don't realize all of the ways that you are learning to love. Disorderedly. <laughs> so, what we need to do, what, what I wanna suggest is something, this is about as close as practical as I'm gonna get, all right? I think there are two important implications of this. First of all, I want to encourage you, and you, you could make this a sort of a theme for meditation, for, for your prayer experiences this week. I encourage you to take what I'm gonna call a liturgical audit of your life. And what I mean is this. Find some way and some quiet contemplative space to sort of look at the rhythms and routines and rituals of your life through this lens. And, and be especially attentive to the things that you give yourself to that you might have thought are just something that you do and start to realize that they are doing something to you. Take a look at the things that you give your time to, that you give yourself away to, and ask yourself, what story of the good life is sort of implicitly carried in this practice, in this cultural liturgy? And is it one that aligns with the kingdom vision of Christ? Take, take time to take a liturgical audit of your life. What's shaping you? What's forming you? What's working on your loves below the radar of your consciousness? And I think, I would say, that, that is not necessarily, that the, the outcome of that is not necessarily that you retreat from it or withdraw from it, although there will obviously be some things for which that is certainly true. Um, but sometimes also, it's, it's not like I don't go to the mall, although I try to go as little as possible. Um, but it's almost like once you see something for what it is, 
it, it, it defangs some of its liturgical power a little bit, right? So that's the beginning of a sort of defense mechanism. However, it's insufficient. Because what you also need now more positively is ask yourself, what formative practices do I need to commit myself to that are going to recalibrate my heart? And actually, what my biggest hope is that this would reframe what you think is at stake in church. What you th would see is at stake in worship. Friends, worship, the gathering of the people of God around word and table, is precisely the space into which God invites us so that we can have our hearts retuned to sing the songs of Zion. Right? And to have those, have that sort of unconscious orientation become our true north. Um, You've probably heard, there's this old preacher's joke that, that gets at this. There, there's, a, there's a flood happening in a village. And uh, one man in the village has had the, heard this, this confident revelation that God is going to save him. And so he's confidently trusting in this promise that God is going to save him. And as the waters are rising and, and everybody's sort of sloshing around, some folks, friends come by in a canoe and they say, hey, jump in, we're here to save you. It's like, no, 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 I'm good. God's going to save me. They're like, mm, okay, fine. Um, the waters keep rising, keep rising. He's now up on the roof of his house, and a uh, motorboat speeds by. It says, come on, jump in. We're going to save you. And he's like, no, 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 I'm all good. God's going to save me. All right, have it your way. Floodwaters rise, rises on the peak of his house. He's holding on to the chimney. The water's up to his chin. Coast Guard chugs in on a helicopter. <laughs> Grab the rope, sir, we're going to save you. It's all good. God's going to save me. Doesn't work out so well. Gets to the proverbial gates and says, Lord, I thought you promised to save me. To which God says, I sent you a canoe. I sent you a motorboat. I sent you a helicopter. What more were you looking for? Friends, I think that there's an important spiritual truth in there, which is this. The recalibration of our loves is not about the next new thing. It's not about finding something novel. It's not about finding the right conference or the right book or the right retreat or the right event or some sort of cataclysmic shock, or some thunderbolt of, of, of transformation. The secret to recalibrating your loves is to get in the boat that Jesus sends you. And the boat that Jesus sends us is the body of Christ. That is the ark. That is the space in which we are invited now, not the worship of the body of Christ, is not just us showing up at a club to demonstrate and express our praise and worship to God. We don't go to church to show something to Jesus. We go to church because we are called there by God. The primary actor in worship is not us. The primary agent in worship is not us. The one who is leading and acting and doing in worship is the ascended Christ, who calls us to himself as his body and meets us in worship and is molding and making and remaking us into his image. That's the incarnational lesson. So there's no, stop thinking about what's the next new way that we can do church that it's cool and hip and relevant and will keep people in. The, the new way is the ancient way which is to find the practices of the body of Christ and to see that they aren't just something that we do, but that they are doing something to us. That this is the space in which Christ will transform us. We keep looking for God as if the new, uh, in the new, as if grace was always bound up with the next best thing. But in the midst of that, Jesus encourages us to attend a weekly meal. It's like having supper. It's banal, it's mundane in some ways. It might even be boring every once in a while. But it's doing something to you. It's immersing the gospel story in you. There's a great quip from Mark Twain where he says, he who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can learn in no other way. 
Make sense? Right? So if I imagine I, I've carried a cat by the tail and now I'm going to describe it to you and, and I do it in wonderful prose, that's never going to be the same as me saying, here's your cat. Right? Why? Because there is an irreducible kind of understanding that comes with that experience. Friends, I'm suggesting that there is an irreducible way of absorbing the gospel that happens in the practices of worship. That for me to be part of a body of Christ that prays a prayer of confession over and over and over again, and then over and over again, always and immediately hears the good news announced of my absolution, my pardon, the mercy that God gives me. That is for me to start getting a story that sinks into my bones. And it's one of the reasons too why, th this is about sort of knowing things in your gut. And now you can also start to understand why worship has a bodily component to it. And you start to realize, why was it that ancient Christians, when they would gather to hear God's word and to celebrate the Lord's Supper, when they would go through this rhythm of reminding themselves of God's holiness and their sinfulness and God's confession, they would do it on their knees. Because this is like carrying a cat by the tail. It's like my old rickety knees know something about God's mercy. But that's not near as powerful as being told to stand up when he says, you're forgiven. There are ways that we absorb the gospel in worship that now sink into your bones and become the orienting story that guides your very orientation to the world. So you don't have to go looking for the next best thing the most potent, the most charged, the most transformative sight of the Spirit's work is found in this really unlikely place, the church. Let's pray. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.